Chapter 9. Women, Caste and Reform. 9. Women, Caste and Reform. Have you ever thought of how children lived about 200 years ago? Nowadays most girls from middle class families go to school and often study with boys. On growing up, many of them go to colleges and universities and take up jobs after that. They have to be adults before they are legally married and according to law, they can marry anyone they like from any caste and community and widows can remarry too. All women, like all men, can vote and stand for elections. Of course, these rights are not actually enjoyed by all. Poor people have to education, and in many families, women cannot choose their husbands. Fig. 1 Sati. Salvin, 1813. This was one of the many pictures of Sati painted by the European artists who came to India. The practice of Sati was seen as evidence of the barbarism of the East. 200 years ago things were very different. Most children were married off at an early age. Both Hindu and Muslim men could marry more than one wife. In some parts of the country, widows were praised if they chose death by burning themselves on the funeral pyre of their husbands. Women who died in this manner, whether willingly or otherwise, were called sati, meaning virtuous women. Women's rights to property were also restricted. Besides, most women had virtually no access to education. In many parts of the country people believed she would become a widow. Differences between men and women were not the only ones in society. In most regions, people were divided along lines of caste. Brahmins and Kshatriyas considered themselves as upper castes. Others, such as traders and moneylenders, often referred to as Vaishyas, were placed after them. Then came peasants, and artisans such as weavers and potters, referred to as Shudras. At the lowest rung were those who labored to keep cities and villages clean or worked at jobs that upper castes considered polluting, that is, it could lead to the loss of caste status. The upper castes also treated many of these groups at the bottom as untouchable. They were not allowed to enter temples, draw water from the wells used by the upper castes, or bathe in ponds where upper castes bathed. They were seen as inferior human beings. Over the 19th and 20th centuries, many of these norms and perceptions slowly changed. Let us see how this happened. Working towards change. From the early 19th century, we find debates and discussions about social customs and practices taking on a new character. One important reason for this was the development of new forms of communication. For the first time, books, newspapers, magazines, leaflets and pamphlets were printed. These were far cheaper and far more accessible than the manuscripts that you have read about in Class 7. Therefore ordinary people could read these, and many of them could also write and express their ideas in their own languages. All kinds of issues, social, political, economic and religious, could now be debated and discussed by men, and sometimes by women as well, in the new cities. The discussions could reach out to a wider public, and could become linked to movements for social change. These debates were often initiated by Indian reformers and reform groups. One such reformer was Raja Ramahan Roy, 1772-1833. He founded a reform association known as the Brahmo Sabha, later known as the Brahmo Samaj, in Calcutta. People such as Ramahan Roy are described as reformers because they felt that changes were necessary in society, and unjust practices needed to be done away with. They thought that the best way to ensure such changes was by persuading people to give up old practices and adopt a new way of life. Activity can you think of the ways in which social customs and practices were discussed in the pre-printing age when books, newspapers and pamphlets were not readily available? Ramahan Roy was keen to spread the knowledge of Western education in the country and bring about greater freedom and equality for women. He wrote about the way women were forced to bear the burden of domestic work, confined to the home and the kitchen, and not allowed to move out and become educated. Fig. 2 Raja Ramahan Roy, painted by Rembrandt Peel, 1833. Changing the Lives of Widows Ramahan Roy was particularly moved by the problems widows faced in their lives. He began a campaign against the practice of sati. Ramahan Roy was well versed in Sanskrit, Persian and several other Indian and European languages. He tried to show through his writings that the practice of widow burning had no sanction in ancient texts. By the early 19th century, as you have read in Chapter 7, many British officials had also begun to criticize Indian traditions and customs. They were therefore more than willing to listen to Ramahan who was reputed to be a learned man. In 1829, Sati was banned. The strategy adopted by Ramahan was used by later reformers as well. 
Whenever they wished to challenge a practice that seemed harmful, they tried to find a verse or sentence in the ancient sacred texts that supported their point of view. They then suggested that the practice as it existed at present was against early tradition. Fig. Three Hook Swinging Festival. In this popular festival, devotees underwent a peculiar form of suffering as part of ritual worship. With hooks pierced through their skin they swung themselves on a wheel. In the early 19th century, when European officials began criticizing Indian customs and rituals as barbaric, this was one of the rituals that came under attack. Source 1. We first tie them down to the pile. Ramahan Roy published many pamphlets to spread his ideas. Some of these were written as a dialogue between the advocate and critic of a traditional practice. Here is one such dialogue on sati. Advocate of sati. Women are by nature of inferior understanding, without resolution, unworthy of trust, many of them, on the death of their husbands, become desirous of accompanying them. But to remove every chance of their trying to escape from the blazing fire, in burning them we first tie them down to the pile. Opponent of Sati, when did you ever afford them a fair opportunity of exhibiting their natural capacity? How then can you accuse them of want of understanding? If, after instruction in knowledge and wisdom, a person cannot comprehend or retain what has been taught him, we may consider him as deficient. But if you do not educate women how can you see them as inferior? For instance, one of the most famous reformers, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, used the ancient texts to suggest that widows could remarry. His suggestion was adopted by British officials, and a law was passed in 1856 permitting widow remarriage. Those who were against the remarriage of widows opposed Vidyasagar, and even boycotted him. By the second half of the 19th century, the movement in favor of widow remarriage spread to other parts of the country. In the Telugu-speaking areas of the Madras Presidency, Virasalingam Pantulu formed an association for widow remarriage. Around the same time young intellectuals and reformers in Bombay pledged themselves to working for the same cause. In the north, Swami Dayanand Saraswati, who founded the reform association called Arya Samaj, also supported widow remarriage. Yet, the number of widows who actually remarried remained low. Those who married were not easily accepted in society and conservative groups continued to oppose the new law. Activity. This argument was taking place more than 175 years ago. Write down the different arguments you may have heard around you on the worth of women. In what ways have the views changed? Fig. For Swami Dayanand Saraswati. Dayanand founded the Arya Samaj in 1875, an organization that attempted to reform Hinduism. Girls begin going to school. Many of the reformers felt that education for girls was necessary in order to improve the condition of women. Vidyasagar in Calcutta and many other reformers in Bombay set up schools for girls. When the first schools were opened in the mid-19th century, many people were afraid of them. They feared that schools would take girls away from home, prevent them from doing their domestic duties. Moreover, girls had to travel through public places in order to reach school. Many people felt that this would have a corrupting influence on them. They felt that girls should stay away from public spaces. Therefore, throughout the 19th century, most educated women were taught at home by liberal fathers or husbands. Sometimes women taught themselves. Do you remember what you read about Rash Sundari Devi in your book Social and Political Life last year? She was one of those who secretly learned to read and write in the flickering light of candles at night. Fig. 5. Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. In the latter part of the century, schools for girls were established by the Arya Samaj in Punjab, and Yadarao Phool in Maharashtra. In aristocratic Muslim households in North India, women learned to read the Quran in Arabic. They were taught by women who came home to teach. Some reformers such as Mumtaz Ali reinterpreted verses from the Quran to argue for women's education. The first Urdu novels began to be written from the late 19th century. Amongst other things, these were meant to encourage women to read about religion and domestic management in a language they could understand. Women write about women. Fig. Six students of Hindu Mahila Vidyalaya, 1875. When girls' schools were first set up in the 19th century, it was generally believed that the curriculum for girls ought to be less taxing than that for boys. The Hindu Mahila Vidyalaya was one of the first institutions to provide girls with the kind of learning that was usual for boys at the time. From the early 20th century, Muslim women like the Begums of Bhopal played a notable role in promoting education among women. They founded a primary school for girls at Aligarh. Another remarkable woman, Begum Rokia Sakawat Hossein started schools for Muslim girls in Padna and Calcutta. 
She was a fearless critic of conservative ideas, arguing that religious leaders of every faith accorded an inferior place to women. By the 1880s, Indian women began to enter universities. Some of them trained to be doctors, some became teachers. Many women began to write and publish their critical views on the place of women in society. Tarabai Shind, a woman educated at home at Pune, published a book, Stripperushchulna, a comparison between women and men, criticizing the social differences between men and women. Fig. 7. Pandita Ramabai. Pandita Ramabai, a great scholar of Sanskrit, felt that Hinduism was oppressive towards women, and wrote a book about the miserable lives of upper caste Hindu women. She founded a widow's home at Pune to provide shelter to widows who had been treated badly by their husband's relatives. Here women were trained so that they could support themselves economically. Needless to say, all this more than alarmed the orthodox. For instance, many Hindu nationalists felt that Hindu women were adopting Western ways and that this would corrupt Hindu culture and erode family values. Orthodox Muslims were also worried about the impact of these changes. As you can see, by the end of the 19th century, women themselves were actively working for reform. They wrote books, edited magazines, founded schools and training centers, and set up women's associations. From the early 20th century, they formed political pressure groups to push through laws for female suffrage, the right to vote, and better health care and education for women. Some of them joined various kinds of nationalist and socialist movements from the 1920s. In the 20th century, leaders such as Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhas Chandra Bose lent their support to demands for greater equality and freedom for women. Nationalist leaders promised that there would be full suffrage for all men and women after independence. However, till then they asked women to concentrate on the anti-British struggles. Source 2. Once a woman's husband has died. In her book, Stripperush Chilna, Tara Bai Shind wrote, Isn't a woman's life as dear to her as yours is to you? It's as if women are meant to be made of something different from men altogether, made from dust from earth or rock or rusted iron whereas you and your lives are made from the purest gold. You're asking me what I mean. I mean once a woman's husband has died, what's in store for her? The barber comes to shave all the curls and hair off her head, just to cool your eyes. She is shut out from going to weddings, receptions and other auspicious occasions that married women go to. And why all these restrictions? Because her husband has died. She is unlucky. Ill fate is written on her forehead. Her face is not to be seen, it's a bad omen. Terabai Shind, Stripperushchulna. Law Against Child Marriage. Fig. 8 Bride at the Age of 8. This is a picture of a child bride at the beginning of the 20th century. Did you know that even today over 20% of girls in India are married below the age of 18? With the growth of women's organizations and writings on these issues, the momentum for reform gained strength. People challenged another established custom, that of child marriage. There were a number of Indian legislators in the Central Legislative Assembly who fought to make a law preventing child marriage. In 1929 the Child Marriage Restraint Act was passed without the kind of bitter debates and struggles that earlier laws had seen. According to the Act no man below the age of 18 and woman below the age of 16 could marry. Subsequently these limits were raised to 21 for men and 18 for women. Caste and Social Reform some of the social reformers we have been discussing also criticized caste inequalities. Ramahan Roy translated an old Buddhist text that was critical of caste. The Pradhana Samaj adhered to the tradition of bhakti that believed in spiritual equality of all castes. In Bombay, the Paramhans Mandali was founded in 1840 to work for the abolition of caste. Many of these reformers and members of reform associations were people of upper castes. Often, in secret meetings, these reformers would violate caste taboos on food and touch, in an effort to get rid of the hold of caste prejudice in their lives. There were also others who questioned the injustices of the caste social order. During the course of the 19th century, Christian missionaries began setting up schools for tribal groups and lower caste children. These children were thus equipped with some resources to make their way into a changing world. At the same time, the poor began leaving their villages to look for jobs that were opening up in the cities. There was work in the factories that were coming up, and jobs in municipalities. You have read about the expansion of cities in Chapter 6. Think of the new demands of labor this created. Drains had to be dug, roads laid, buildings constructed, and cities cleaned. This required coolies, diggers, carriers, bricklayers, sewage cleaners, sweepers, palanquin bearers, rickshaw pullers. Where did this labor come from? Fig. 
9. A coolie ship, 19th century. This coolie ship, named John Allen, carried many Indian laborers to Mauritius where they did a variety of forms of hard labor. Most of these laborers were from low castes. The poor from the villages and small towns, many of them from low castes, began moving to the cities where there was a new demand for labor. Some also went to work in plantations in Assam, Mauritius, Trinidad and Indonesia. Work in the new locations was often very hard. But the poor, the people from low castes, saw this as an opportunity to get away from the oppressive hold that upper caste landowners exercised over their lives and the daily humiliation they suffered. Who could produce shoes? Leather workers have been traditionally held in contempt since they work with dead animals which are seen as dirty and polluting. During the First World War, however, there was a huge demand for shoes for the armies. Caste prejudice against leather work meant that only the traditional leather workers and shoemakers were ready to supply army shoes. So they could ask for high prices and gain impressive profits. Demands for equality and justice. Fig. 10 Madagas making shoes, 19th century Andhra Pradesh. Madagas were an important untouchable caste of present-day Andhra Pradesh. They were experts at cleaning hides, tanning them for use, and sewing sandals. There were other jobs too. The army, for instance, offered opportunities. A number of Mahar people, who were regarded as untouchable, found jobs in the Mahar regiment. The father of B. R. Ambedkar, the leader of the Dalit movement, taught at an army school. Fig. 11 doublas of Gujarat carrying mangoes to the market. Doublas labored for upper caste landowners, cultivating their fields, and working at a variety of odd jobs at the landlord's house. No place inside the classroom. In the Bombay presidency, as late as 1829, untouchables were not allowed into even government schools. When some of them pressed hard for that right, they were allowed to sit on the veranda outside the classroom and listen to the lessons, without polluting, the room where upper caste boys were taught. Demands for equality and justice. Gradually, by the second half of the 19th century, people from within the non-Brahmin castes began organizing movements against caste discrimination, and demanded social equality and justice. The Sadnami movement in central India was founded by Gesaitis who worked among the leather workers and organized a movement to improve their social status. In eastern Bengal, Haridas the Kurs Matua sect worked among Chandala cultivators. Haridas questioned Brahmanical texts that supported the caste system. In what is present-day Kerala, a guru from Ezava caste, Sri Narayana Guru, proclaimed the ideals of unity for his people. He argued against treating people unequally on the basis of caste differences. According to him, all humankind belong to the same caste. One of his famous statements was, ORU Jati, ORU Matam, ORU Deva Manushayanu, one caste, one religion, one god for humankind. All these sects were founded by leaders who came from non-Brahmin castes and worked amongst them. They tried to change those habits and practices which provoked the contempt of dominant castes. They tried to create a sense of self-esteem among the subordinate castes. Activity 1. Imagine that you are one of the students sitting in the school veranda and listening to the lessons. What kind of questions would be rising in your mind? 2. Some people thought this situation was better than the total lack of education for untouchable people. Would you agree with this view? Fig. 12 Sri Narayana Guru. Gulamguri. One of the most vocal amongst the low caste leaders was Yadarao Fool. Born in 1827, he studied in schools set up by Christian missionaries. On growing up he developed his own ideas about the injustices of caste society. He set out to attack the Brahmins' claim that they were superior to others, since they were Aryans. Fool argued that the Aryans were foreigners, who came from outside the subcontinent, and defeated and subjugated the true children of the country, those who had lived here from before the coming of the Aryans. As the Aryans established their dominance, they began looking at the defeated population as inferior, as low-caste people. According to Fool, the upper castes had no right to their land and power. In reality, the land belonged to indigenous people, the so-called low castes. Fig. 13 Yadarao Fool. Fool claimed that before Aryan rule there existed a golden age when warrior peasants tilled the land and ruled the Maratha countryside in just and fair ways. He proposed that Shudras, laboring castes, and ATI Shudras, untouchables, should unite to challenge caste discrimination. The Satyashodak Samaj, an association Fool founded, propagated caste equality. Source 3. Me here and you over there. Fool was also critical of the anti-colonial nationalism that was preached by upper caste leaders. He wrote, 
The Brahmins have hidden away the sword of their religion which has cut the throat of the people's prosperity and now go about posing as great patriots of their country. They give this advice to our Shudra, Muslim and Parsi youth that unless we put away all quarreling amongst ourselves about the divisions between high and low in our country and come together, our country will never make any progress. It will be unity to serve their purposes, and then it will be me here and you over there again. Yadava Fool, The Cultivator's Whipcord. Activity. Carefully read Source 3. What do you think Yadarao Fool meant by, me here and you over there again? In 1873, Fool wrote a book named Gulamgari, meaning slavery. Some ten years before this, the American Civil War had been fought, leading to the end of slavery in America. Fool dedicated his book to all those Americans who had fought to free slaves, thus establishing a link between the conditions of the lower castes in India and the black slaves in America. As this example shows, Fool extended his criticism of the caste system to argue against all forms of inequality. He was concerned about the plight of upper caste women, the miseries of the laborer, and the humiliation of the low castes. This movement for caste reform was continued in the 20th century by other great Dalit leaders like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar in Western India and E. V. Ramaswamy Naikar in the South. We are also human beings. In 1927, Ambedkar said, We now want to go to the tank only to prove that, like others, we are also human beings. Hindu society should be reorganized on two main principles, equality and absence of casteism. Who could enter temples? Ambedkar was born into a Mahar family. As a child he experienced what caste prejudice meant in everyday life. In school he was forced to sit outside the classroom on the ground, and was not allowed to drink water from taps that upper caste children used. After finishing school, he got a fellowship to go to the U.S. for higher studies. On his return to India in 1919, he wrote extensively about upper caste power in contemporary society. In 1927, Ambedkar started a temple entry movement, in which his Mahar caste followers participated. Brahmin priests were outraged when the Dalits used water from the temple tank. Fig. 14 The Gateway to the Madurai Temple, drawn by Thomas Daniel, 1792. Untouchables were not allowed anywhere near such gateways until the temple entry movement began. Ambedkar led three such movements for temple entry between 1927 and 1935. His aim was to make everyone see the power of caste prejudices within society. The Non-Brahmin Movement. In the early 20th century, the non-Brahmin movement started. The initiative came from those non-Brahmin castes that had acquired access to education, wealth and influence. They argued that Brahmins were heirs of Aryan invaders from the north who had conquered southern lands from the original inhabitants of the region, the indigenous Dravidian races. They also challenged Brahmanical claims to power. E. V. Ramaswamy Naikar, or Periyar, as he was called, came from a middle-class family. Interestingly, he had been an ascetic in his early life and had studied Sanskrit scriptures carefully. Later, he became a member of the Congress, only to leave it in disgust when he found that at a feast organized by nationalists, seating arrangements followed caste distinctions, that is, the lower castes were made to sit at a distance from the upper castes. Convinced that untouchables had to fight for their dignity, Periyar founded the self-respect movement. He argued that untouchables were the true upholders of an original Tamil and Dravidian culture which had been subjugated by Brahmins. He felt that all religious authorities saw social divisions and inequality as God-given. Untouchables had to free themselves, therefore, from all religions in order to achieve social equality. Fig. 15e. V. Ramaswamy Naikar Periyar. Periyar was an outspoken critic of Hindu scriptures, especially the codes of Manu, the ancient lawgiver, and the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana. He said that these texts had been used to establish the authority of Brahmins over lower castes and the domination of men over women. These assertions did not go unchallenged. The forceful speeches, writings and movements of lower caste leaders did lead to rethinking and some self-criticism among upper caste nationalist leaders. But Orthodox Hindu society also reacted by founding Sanatan Dharma Sabhas and the Bharat Dharma Mahamandal in the north, and associations like the Brahmin Sabha in Bengal. The object of these associations was to uphold caste distinctions as a cornerstone of Hinduism, and show how this was sanctified by scriptures. Debates and struggles over caste continued beyond the colonial period and are still going on in our own times. Source 5. Periyar on Women. Periyar wrote. 
Only with the arrival of words such as Thara Mukartham our women had become puppets in the hands of their husbands, we ended up with such fathers who advised their daughters that they had been gifted away to their husbands and they belonged to their husbands' place. This is the result of our association with Sanskrit. Periyar, cited in Periyar Chintanikal. Activity. Why does caste remain such a controversial issue today? What do you think was the most important movement against caste in colonial times? Organizing for reform. Fig. 16 Keshub Chunder Sen, one of the main leaders of the Brahmo Samaj. The Brahmo Samaj. The Brahmo Samaj, formed in 1830, prohibited all forms of idolatry and sacrifice believed in the Upanishads, and forbade its members from criticizing other religious practices. It critically drew upon the ideals of religions, especially of Hinduism and Christianity, looking at their negative and positive dimensions. Darozio and Young Bengal. Fig. 17 Henry Darozio. Henry Louis Vivian Darozio, a teacher at Hindu College, Calcutta, in the 1820s, promoted radical ideas and encouraged his pupils to question all authority. Referred to as the Young Bengal Movement, his students attacked tradition and custom, demanded education for women and campaigned for the freedom of thought and expression. The Ramakrishna Mission in Vivekananda. Named after Ramakrishna Paramhansa. Swami Vivekananda's guru, the Ramakrishna Mission stressed the ideal of salvation through social service and selfless action. Fig. 18 Swami Vivekananda. The Pradhana Samaj. Established in 1867 at Bombay, the Pradhana Samaj sought to remove caste restrictions, abolish child marriage, encourage the education of women, and end the ban on widow remarriage. Its religious meetings drew upon Hindu, Buddhist and Christian texts. The Veda Samaj. Established in Madras, Chennai, in 1864, the Veda Samaj was inspired by the Brahmo Samaj. It worked to abolish caste distinctions and promote widow remarriage and women's education. Its members believed in one God. They condemned the superstitions and rituals of Orthodox Hinduism. The Aligarh Movement. Fig. 19 Syed Ahmed Khan. The Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College, founded by Saeed Ahmed Khan in 1875 at Aligarh, later became the Aligarh Muslim University. The institution offered modern education, including Western science, to Muslims. The Aligarh movement, as it was known, had an enormous impact in the area of educational reform. The Singh Sabha movement. Reform organizations of the Sikhs, the first Singh Sabhas were formed at Amritsar in 1873 and at Lahore in 1879. The Sabhas sought to rid Sikhism of superstitions, caste distinctions and practices seen by them as non-Sikh. They promoted education among the Sikhs, often combining modern instruction with Sikh teachings. Fig. 20 Khalsa College, Amritsar, established in 1892 by the leaders of the Singh Sabha movement. Elsewhere, black slaves and white planters. You have read about how Yadarao Fool established a connection in his book Gulamgari between caste oppression and the practice of slavery in America. What was this system of slavery? Fig. 21 Slave Sale, South Carolina, USA, 1856. Here you see potential buyers examining African slaves at an auction. From the time that European explorers and traders landed in Africa in the 17th century, a trade in slaves began. Black people were captured and brought from Africa to America, sold to white planters, and made to work on cotton and other plantations, most of them in the southern United States. In the plantations they had to work long hours, typically from dawn to dusk, punished for inefficient work, and whipped and tortured. Many people, white and black, opposed slavery through organized protest. In doing so, they invoked the spirit of the American Revolution of 1776, exhorting. See your declaration, Americans. Do you understand your own language? In his moving Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln held that those who had fought slavery had done so for the cause of democracy. He urged the people to strive for racial equality so that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Let's imagine. Imagine you are a teacher in the school set up by Rokia Hossein. There are 20 girls in your charge. Write an account of the discussions that might have taken place on any one day in the school. Let's recall. 1. What social ideas did the following people support? Ramahan Roy. Dayanand Saraswati. Birasalingam Pantulu. Yadarao Fool, Pandita Ramabai, Periyar, Mumtaz Ali, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. 2. State whether true or false. Of when the British captured Bengal they framed many new laws to regulate the rules regarding marriage, adoption, inheritance of property, etc. 
B. Social reformers had to discard the ancient texts in order to argue for reform in social practices. C. Reformers got full support from all sections of the people of the country. D. The Child Marriage Restraint Act was passed in 1829. Let's discuss. 3. How did the knowledge of ancient texts help the reformers promote new laws? 4. What were the different reasons people had for not sending girls to school? 5. Why were Christian missionaries attacked by many people in the country? Would some people have supported them too? If so, for what reasons? 6. In the British period, what new opportunities opened up for people who came from castes that were regarded as low? 7. How did Yadarao the reformers justify their criticism of caste inequality in society? 8. Why did Fool dedicate his book Gulamgari to the American movement to free slaves? 9. What did Ambedkar want to achieve through the temple entry movement? 10. Why were Yadarao Fool and Ramaswamy Naikar critical of the